even your guy Now you travel so far away Fly, 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 me fly through the sky No fine tears can open my mind No, we're not so far from my dream Energy brings us life Running like the midnight, white light Super little oh, oh Until the twilight, the bright skies Super little oh, oh Run up to the moon We will go beyond the reason Tonight Well, welcome, welcome, welcome. This is uh, another one of the really, truly great MetaVisionary lectures in the Meta ship and in our, our lecture dome. And uh, this lecture is going to be our introduction to orbits. You know, we talked last time about light and how important it is to observe light. Uh, but now we're going to talk about uh, what it takes to get into orbit, and what orbits uh, are important. Uh, there are some some orbits are just really special, and we need to talk about uh, those orbits so that you can get a feel for how these things in space really work. Now, when you look at this particular slide, uh, this is one of my favorite, all-time favorite images, because here is Bruce McCandless, and he is in the manned maneuvering unit. He's got a backpack on, and he's flying towards... Uh, the the space shuttle. What a, what a wonderful image this is. But let me say, he is in orbit. He is a, literally a spacecraft onto himself, and he is literally uh, uh, going around the Earth. If he doesn't uh, increase the uh, uh, jets, pushing him backward or forward or pirouetting or doing some of the other things. He will indeed orbit the Earth. And although you look down and you see the day side of the Earth, uh, within a matter of less than 40 minutes, he'll probably be on the night side as he orbits the Earth. So, so uh, anything that gets into space like that uh, gets into orbit, even as small as a human with a spectacular backpack on. So um, uh, here's to you, Bruce McCandless, uh, really uh, pretty, pretty special. Okay, today there's several things we're going to uh, talk about. We're going to talk about Kepler's three laws of motion. Kepler um, uh, developed these laws um, uh, that uh, we use, and this is how we go from planet to planet or even around our own planet. And then, of course, there's some fundamental laws of gravitation that Newton created. Uh, that uh, is uh, really important to understand the law of gravitation. We're going to explain the different type of orbits used by Earth satellites in particular. Uh, and then um, uh, we're going to be able to uh, draw and label orbit diagrams in terms of um, uh, where certain important positions are in these orbits. Okay. So the outline is indeed uh, Kepler's laws, then we'll talk about Newton's laws, his uh, universal law of gravity. And this really allows us to get a spacecraft into orbit. And then uh, what are the most used orbits? Why are they so special? And then some really special locations. These special locations allow us even more unusual orbits to execute. And, and we take advantage of all those in really special ways. Okay, well, let's get started. Uh, Kepler was able to, uh, uh, he was um, uh, lived in a uh, pro, interacted with uh, a, a whole series of astronomers. One particular astronomer, uh, Tycho Brahe, was making really beautiful, careful position measurements of all the planets over long periods of time. Uh, Kepler was a mathematician and he convinced Tycho Brahe to give him uh, that data. And from that data, he created three laws. And we use these laws today. And, and, and he did this um, uh, about um, uh, 500 years ago, okay? So 
uh, the first law is the orbit of the planets or ellipses with the sun on focus, okay? Now here is a diagram. It's an exaggerated diagram of the sun and the earth. And um, uh, we have terminology for this uh, uh, elliptical orbit. When we're close uh, to the sun, we call it perihelion. Helion meaning sun, or para meaning close. Aphelion is the furthest position away from the sun. Now this is, as I said, an exaggerated orbit. Our orbit is really nearly circular, but not quite, it's still elliptical. And therefore, we will have uh, this um, uh, aphelion and perihelion. And just to uh, complete our own Earth in this um, uh, concept, the Earth is at perihelion on January 4th. So that means it's as close uh, to the sun um, uh, on January 4th. That's Northern Hemisphere winter. Okay. That means. Um, uh, we're close and get more solar energy into the southern hemisphere at perihelion. And that turns out to be a good thing because we have more ocean in the southern hemisphere and the ocean is absorbing the heat from the sun. So we're in a good climatic position in this orbit. Okay. That means then the Earth is at aphelion on uh, July 6th. Okay. Well, let's go to um, uh, Kepler's next law. Uh, his second law is really quite fascinating. And this is all about how uh, the, the timing of the motion of each object in its elliptical orbit um, around another object. And in this case, uh, the sun. So here is, uh, here is the sun at the center and this exaggerated elliptical orbit the Earth, and then we see that uh, we see these blue triangles, okay? So these blue triangles are, uh, if you had a stopwatch and you clicked it when we're near uh, aphelion, and then over a period of time, you clicked it and, and, and that created an interval that we call T. So time interval T, in this case, it might be, you know, two weeks uh, worth of time. And then uh, that produces an area uh, uh, between the Earth, uh, Sun, and back to the Earth. You can actually calculate what this area is. And then that area, when we're at aphelion, has, has to be obeyed. It, it means equal areas in equal times. So that means since we're closest to the Sun, it looks like we have to go quite a bit further in distance. And indeed, that's the case. The planet actually speeds up during perihelion, and it sort of slows down at aphelion, okay? So uh, this is really a, a critical thing to remember. This is why satellites aphelion uh, uh, around the Earth, they sit they, they are, are around um, an object, it could be the sun or whatever, they, they seem to hover because they're furthest away in their orbit. Okay, so sweeping out equal areas in equal times, right? That's the important second law. Now the third law is uh, uh, an equation. Okay, I'm gonna say it in words and we're gonna look at it and, 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 and do a little calculations. And uh, the, the, uh, the equation basically is the square of the orbital period, that means how long it takes for the planet to go completely around the sun. The Earth, that's uh, 365 days on that order. So the square of that orbital period is directly proportional to the cube of the mean distance between the sun and the planet, okay? Now, because this exaggerated uh, orbit uh, is highly elliptical, uh, there, the average distance that we spend away seems to be somewhere in between. But in reality, our real orbit, which is nearly circular, uh, the average or the mean distance rather is the, um, 
uh, one astronomical unit. It's 93 million miles. Now, it turns out that means there's parts of our orbit for which a little further than that. There's parts of our orbit where we're a little closer than that, okay? So when we're closer than 93 million miles, it's going to be in that, in that um, uh, time for which uh, we're at perihelion, okay? And when we are uh, further away, uh, then we uh, uh, are at um, uh, aphelion, and uh, that means we're, we're at slightly greater than one astronomical unit. Well, we can take that equation. So T is the period, A is that um, uh, 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 average distance, and, and we can relate it in this equation. T squared equals A cubed. Okay, T is in years and, and A is in AU. And so you can take a look at the Earth. So we're gonna, we're gonna tag everything to the Earth. Okay, so one Earth year, that means 365 days. One AU, okay, so one squared equals one cubed. Okay, so what is it for the other planets? If we measure the distance to Mars, which is 1.88 astronomical, sorry, 1.52 astronomical units away, then its period is 1.88 years, okay? So that's why, that's why one Mars year is almost like two of our own years. It's um, 365 uh, almost times two and giving you the, the you know, uh, a, a very uh, large period of uh, something like uh, 680 days or so. Now, uh, we go closer to the sun, of course, that means your, uh, your A is uh, less than one, then the period is going to be less than one. And if you're further away, like Jupiter and Saturn, uh, where uh, the distance, the, the average distance is um, greater than one, and indeed, your, your years are going to be um, uh, much greater than one year. So there's Jupiter. You know, nearly 12 years it takes to go around the sun. Saturn, nearly 30 years to go around the sun, okay? And so uh, that law works really well. So that connects many different orbits, many different periods, and, and gives us a little insight as to... Um, how um, uh, uh, objects orbiting the sun uh, will operate. Now, we can, we can take this information and, and hone in on the Earth. It doesn't have to be planets going around the sun. Satellites going around the Earth must indeed obey all three of Kepler's laws. Now, the next important law is really all about gravitation. This is um, Newton's law. So uh, here you see a satellite. Uh, it is producing a force on the uh, on the on the Earth, and the Earth is producing a, a force on the satellite. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, these two forces are equal, and uh, and there's a mathematical expression that tells you what the magnitude it is. Uh, and and so here it is, the uh, the force is equal to a constant. This is called the universal gravitational constant times the mass of the spacecraft, the, the mass of the, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, Earth, uh, divided by the radial distance between the two squared, okay? Now that means basically, since the masses are all known, they don't change, but in a Keplerian orbit, the R changes, okay? So that R, will change as you go around in your orbit. And when you're at aphelion, you're the furthest away uh, uh, from, from the sun in this case, that force is less, okay? You know, this is why you're kind of slowing down. And when the R is um, at perihelion, when you're really close, then that force is greater. And this is where uh, you end up uh, speeding up. Uh, so this universal uh, uh, law is really important. Well, let's use this law to get into orbit. And, and we'll start by using this concept of, of a cannon. Let's fire a cannonball. Now, uh, when we do that here on Earth, 
you know, uh, the concept is, uh, and everyone says it, what, what goes up must come down. And um, that's true to a certain extent, but there is a place when if you move fast enough, that's not true. Okay, so here's the cannon. We, uh, we fire a cannonball horizontally. It comes down to the earth. Now we give it more speed. It goes a greater distance before the earth pulls it down, before that force just pulls it down. But there'll come a speed for which we fire the cannon and it actually will make it all the way around. It goes into what we call orbit. Now, uh, this is uh, also called basically free fall, okay? When you look at the cannonball, it's, it's always trying to fall to the earth, right? So uh, uh, you can experience this a little bit when you're in an elevator and let's say the elevator uh, jumps, I uh, hope that never happens to you, but perhaps it has. All of a sudden you feel like you're lighter, you feel like you lift it up uh, uh, because the floor uh, is uh, been pulled out from under you, you're actually in free fall, okay? You're actually in this process of, of having the Earth pull you down. Uh, you're not in orbit because you, you really uh, aren't moving that fast. Uh, the Earth's going to win on that one, and, um, and hopefully uh, uh, that's an experience uh, that uh, you recover from, so to speak. You, know, you don't go all the way down to the bottom of the, of the shaft. But we use that concept, that free fall concept, a lot to study what we call microgravity or, or being in a, an environment where there's very little gravity. Um, and and, and uh, so that's a long shaft. You drop experiments down that shaft that, that, that feels like you're in orbit, okay, for a little bit. And then, of course, uh, the experiment is over when you, when you hit the bottom of the shaft. So free fall, uh, can be um, um, uh, used like like gravity uh, or the lack of gravity, and of course the International Space Station is a perfect example of being able to have that feeling of free fall, always being in the space station. You never actually hit the ground because you're in this. You have enough velocity to actually uh, get into orbit. Now, uh, if you get more energy you actually can go into uh, more of these elliptical orbits, okay? So uh, we define ellipticity of an orbit with a number, and that number is um, uh, uh, depends on whether you're orbiting the Earth or in a circular or an elliptical or have enough velocity to actually leave the, uh, the Earth. In other words, you overcome that force. And so E, which represents that ellipticity, is shown here very nicely. Um, a circular orbit, a perfectly circular orbit has E equals zero. Now, an orbit that is still orbiting the object, uh, that E will go up nearly to one. Not quite one, but nearly to one. If you actually uh, end up with an elliptical orbit where the ellipticity is one, you're in the process of leaving, you've overcome the gravitational force, uh, you're, you're able to leave the Earth, and off you go. And um, uh, this, is, uh, this is about um, uh, a little more than 11 kilometers per second. So, I mean, you've really got to be moving to be able to pull that off. So, uh, uh, E equals 1 is a parabola. You're not coming back to the Earth. And if E is much greater than one, or at least greater than one, you're definitely not going to come back to the Earth. You actually have, uh, are leave, going to leave the solar system. Um, uh, okay, so that's a that's a real critical number. Well, how do we use these things to navigate around? So uh, you you may have heard when we leave the Earth and we fly to Mars, this actually takes a long time to do. Mars has a very elliptical orbit compared to Earth. Here we see in this diagram, uh, the Mars orbit looks a little strange. It doesn't look perfectly circular when you compare that against the Earth orbit. 
And that indeed is because it's slightly elliptical. So it's a little further away from the sun in one portion than another. Uh, uh, but when we launch something to Mars, both the Earth and the Mars need to be in a configuration like you see here on the left, where Earth at launch, Mars at launch, okay, and then Mars um, uh, is moving in its orbit, the Earth is moving in its orbit, and of course it's going to move faster. Anything closer to uh, the body that it orbits moves faster than things that are further away. So now you see Earth at arrival is very far away from where Mars is at. And Mars at arrival uh, is shown here where the, the green line is the orbit uh, of the spacecraft that we sent. Now, remember I said orbit. doesn't look like an orbit. It looks like some sort of of um, arc, but indeed, if we leave the orbit of the Earth, uh, you know, on a parabolic trajectory, we actually uh, um, are um, in an orbit that is orbiting the sun, okay? This is indeed how, you know, and so the, the green segment really is where the Earth's orbit and Mars orbit connect in, a, in an elliptical orbit that is created by the spacecraft, having just enough energy to leave the Earth but still be in orbit around the sun, that takes more energy uh, to be able to create a parabolic or hyperbolic orbit about the sun. <clears throat> and now uh, you can see uh, the, the orbits of Earth and Mars have got to be just in the right place for us to leave Earth and make it to Mars uh, in that one instant of time, okay? Now let's take another example of uh, how we uh, go from place to place in the solar system, but a much different one. Uh, this is going to be our visit to Pluto. And as many people may know, uh, Pluto was, a, 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 we flew by Pluto in 2015. We launched the spacecraft in 2006, and you can see Pluto's orbit here, the sun at the center. Now, uh, Pluto orbits the sun every 248 Earth years, okay? Every 248 Earth years. So when we saw Pluto for the first time in the 1930s, okay, and then we launched in 2006, we did not have a complete orbit did not see the complete orbit around, um, uh, around the sun. Pluto hadn't made a complete orbit. And so using Kepler's laws, we may have a thousand orbits that are completely consistent with the observations we've made because we haven't made a complete orbit. Now this is a real dilemma it, because if we launch and then do a flyby, uh, uh, and we think Pluto is at one location and we take pictures and it's not because it's in a slightly different orbit, then we've really messed up. And so uh, we developed a technique called operational navigation for which uh, uh, we here at Earth took pictures of Pluto, to horizons as it was uh, flying towards Pluto, took pictures, triangulated them, and then we constantly iterated to get uh, an understanding of Pluto's orbit, therefore its exact position in the um, in the sky. Now, uh, for us to be able to fly by Pluto, we had to have enough energy, and it turns out it's flying at about 16 uh, uh, kilometers per second, a little more than 16 kilometers per second, and that is enough to leave the gravitational force of the sun it is on a hyperbolic trajectory. So it is not coming back. It's not gonna come back and, and orbit, um, uh, orbit the Earth. Uh, and uh, and um, uh, that's, um, that's a really exciting um, uh, mission. Now, here I'm going to show you a simulation, which uh, we actually pulled off. This is an accurate simulation of uh, how the uh, uh, spacecraft, New Horizons, flew by Pluto. Here it is, it's flying towards Pluto. 
Now, look at the spacecraft and the design of it. If it takes pictures, as you see here, what we have to do is we literally have to move the spacecraft. This is really pretty exciting uh, because um, uh, that means we're imaging uh, each of these objects. They better be exactly what we expect them to be. You can see where they are in their orbits or where we think they are, and indeed, uh, we flew by Pluto, uh, and then and then as we left, we took a good look at it from behind, and indeed uh, uh, that eclipsed the sun, and we could see that Pluto had an atmosphere. Now we're radioing our signals back to Earth. There we go, and um, uh, this was just a spectacular account encounter. We're trying to get as much data as possible because this is a flyby. We're never coming back to Pluto with New Horizons at the end. Now this actually worked perfectly, and so let's see uh, what what uh, what happened when we did that. When we took the closest approach picture of Pluto, uh, we we got this uh, fabulous image. So we can go back to the slides. Uh, we'll be able to see uh, what uh, what this uh, beautiful object looked like. And um, and so here it is. There is Pluto. Oh wow! Now Pluto was uh, turns out to be smaller than the Moon. Um, it has uh, fabulous features on it. Uh, this ventricle of what looks like a heart is actually a, a an impact region full of nitrogen snow in the form now of a glacier. Uh, the yellow pieces. Uh, in the polar cap, the yellow part of the image is um, uh, uh, ammonia. Uh, the the red area uh, uh, just below the heart region is uh, the equator of Pluto. These are tholins. These are complex organic molecules, and and we only know this because the reflected light from Pluto came to New Horizons instruments. And we saw it in the spectrum. Okay, so we used the light that was modified by the surface of Pluto to make these beautiful images, allowed us to determine what the composition of this material is. Okay, so um, uh, that 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 was accomplished so well. Now. Here's some fun facts uh, uh, about orbits, uh, something that uh, everyone uh, needs to remember as one thinks about or draws orbits or, you know, trying to get to uh, a certain set of observations. Uh, a satellite rotates around a planetary body in a plane. And that plane has to include the center of mass of the planet. So as you see in this diagram, here's an orbit that is in a plane and it's a, and, and includes the center mass of the planet. Second one, there's an orbit that's in a plane that doesn't include the center of mass of, uh, of the Earth. Now, the interesting thing about that is we'll never be able to make that orbit. That is not a stable orbit. You can't get into that. We can't do that. So, uh, you know, and so uh, uh, that doesn't follow any of Kepler's laws. Now, this is also true for funny orbits like this, okay? So that's, uh, th that's also important uh, to remember. Satellite moves along a circle, ellipse, parabola, or hyperbola. That's what we just talked about. It will never be a triangle like this. And the size of the orbit is, uh, is of course, fixed based on uh, the energy. Now, another key element in orbits uh, is the uh, inclination. And the inclination is seen here, it's measured from the equator, okay? Once again, this, this plane of the orbit, which is shown in red, uh, that plane uh, has to go through this, uh, uh, the center of the Earth, and it does. And it may make an angle with respect to the equator, as you see here. And that angle is called inclination, and we use it as an eye. Now, of course, that means I can increase if we change that plane. If I stays between zero and 90 degrees, then that orbit uh, follows the rotation uh, of the Earth. 
Now, the rotation of the Earth can always be remembered if you if you pull out your right hand, okay, with your thumb up, and then you 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 bring all your you bring all your fingers uh, back. That's the planet. That's the direction you're rotating uh, about the axis where your finger is pointing to the axis. So in this case. Uh, in, in the Earth is uh, going to be rotating in that manner. I will be between zero and 90, and therefore that satellite moves with the direction of the Earth. You can get it to move in the opposite direction by having the inclination become greater. So between 90 and 180 degrees, now the satellite is moving at uh, around the Earth and the Earth is spinning underneath it. Now, why is that important? Well, that means you can look at much more land because it comes flying by you faster uh, as you're in your orbit uh, because it's you're moving against uh, the direction of rotation, okay? So let's look at some examples. Here are uh, the upper one or equatorial orbits, but uh, if you look closely, uh, the one on the left is following the Earth in its rotation, so it has an inclination at zero. The one on the right is an inclination of 180 degrees, and it's actually going against the rotation of the Earth, okay? Now, another really important orbit, of course, is a polar orbit. This is where the inclination is at 90 degrees, um, and, and you can roll this over the pole, and you can then uh, look at these ro uh, what are called uh, retrograde orbits because you're going against the rotation of the Earth, and um, also prograde orbits because you're going with the rotation of the Earth. Okay. Well, once again, that orbit plane has got to include the center of mass of the Earth. Now, here's a little bit more mathematics. Uh, I don't expect people to remember all this, but this provides a little rigor. Uh, we can define the ellipticity, and we do that uh, with mathematics, and, and you see uh, the distances uh, uh, are added, uh, RA, RP on the bottom, RA minus RP at the top. Now that gives us a sense of how elliptical the orbit is. Uh, and then, of course, uh, if it's perfectly circular, the R's are all the same, and that's why E is zero. And um, uh, now you have uh, the, uh, uh, the area uh, also uh, of how much um, area is, uh, is determined in, um, in these orbits. Uh, so you don't have to remember that, but that gives a little rigor as to how we create the uh, ellipticity of an orbit. Also orbit velocity. If you look at a circular orbit, the satellite is always moving at a constant velocity. Uh, but as we talked about, Kepler's second law tells us that as we move around the orbit, as shown on the left-hand side in an elliptical orbit, uh, the velocity slows down and then comes around and then speeds up, and it follows these equations, okay? In the uh, parabola, the velocity at perigee, that's the velocity, uh, as you see, right at that location, that's what we call escape velocity, because once again, remember the ellipticity of a parabola uh, is one, and that means you're not coming back, and so you get the, you get the uh, velocity right at that one location. Okay. Now we're going to talk about special orbits. The first special orbit is called LEO, or low Earth orbit. This is up to about uh, 2,000 kilometers, and uh, uh, so it's really close to the Earth. Uh, uh, the uh, little panel in the uh, upper right shows you uh, a, a little idea about the number of spacecraft in LEO. You can see it's really populated. Of course, these dots are huge compared to the actual spacecraft. There's about 9,000 objects orbiting the Earth, uh, satellites. Uh, some are working about uh, 
2,500 of those satellites are working. The rest are not working. We've used them and they're, they're now defunct. Uh, we call the remaining satellites orbital debris uh, because it's orbiting the earth and it's debris. We don't need them anymore. Uh, and so these are important objects because they look down at the earth um, and make earth science measurements. And this includes things like the International Space Station and the Chinese Space Station. Okay, they are both in low earth orbit. Now the next most important orbit is called MEO or medium earth orbit. And as you see here, it goes from low earth orbit, 2000 uh, up to about 30,000 kilometers. Now, this orbit is great for navigation satellites. Okay, so you can imagine that when you, you're going to a restaurant, you, you, you bring up your, your iPhone and you pull in maps, and then you say, this is where you want to go. You're really talking to a navigation satellite. You're really getting information from that satellite. Actually, you should have at least three in view uh, to give you a good uh, measurement of where you're going. And then um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the application shows you routes on how to get from where you are to a new location on Earth. And that is indeed because you're using navigation satellites. This is the MEO orbit, is the orbit that those satellites uh, like to reside in. As you go further out, there's a really special place. This is at 36,000 kilometers, 36,000 kilometers. You get a satellite out at 36,000 kilometers and, and put it in a, a, a circular orbit or a really uh, very uh, small ellipticity, you know, E is as close to zero as you can get. What you're at is what we call geostationary orbit. And that is because it takes 24 hours for you to go around the Earth. Now here you see, you see this whole series in the upper right of satellites uh, around the Earth in geostationary uh, geo, uh, orbit. Okay, here they all are, and they're hovering just like they're always overhead. And these are really great satellites used for telecommunication. You want to be able to communicate. Uh, you, uh, you, you can look up, there's your satellite. You can, you know, communicate with it. It can send you uh, anything uh, from TV signals. Direct TV is because of the, uh, you know, the, the satellite is uh, nearly overhead. Uh, you you know if you if you get direct TV you got an antenna and you're pointing it, but you don't move that antenna. You're pointing it out there, and that satellite is always in that beam, and that's because it's in a geo orbit. Okay, now this is uh, the instrument views from each of those orbits. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at what we're talking about when we talk about these fabulous orbits. Uh, here's the Earth. All right, now the Earth, uh, let me do this. Here's my hand, here's my thumb, that's the rotational axis. Now I'm gonna uh, pull all my fingers in, that's the direction of motion. Okay, and indeed it's spinning in the right direction. Now we have, we have a, a LEO satellite, okay? In the LEO satellite, all the, all the observations are right there on front. The rest of this is fuel, okay? Solar panels are out because the sun is shining on them, providing them power. And, and these things right here, those are the antennas and they're not big at all. And, and they don't need to be because you're in, your course are in a low earth orbit. If we go to MEO, okay, here's a MEO satellite. This has a few uh, uh, instruments on it. It's got a bigger dish, uh, you know, to, to relay information back to earth. Uh, and, and indeed, um, uh, it's, it's giving you uh, geolocation information. And then, of course, uh, when you're out here at GEO, there's our GEO satellite much further away. This is the one that is, you know, like your TV signals, uh, beaming it back down to Earth. Now, even though the Earth is spinning, 
Uh, these should be these should be moving too, but I, I had them stay here so that we could see the relationship between them. Now this figure is, that you see here is really important because the field of view from geo is the whole earth, from meo is part of the earth, and from leo is even a smaller part of the earth. So you have to recognize the best place to be uh, in terms of your orbit depends on what you're looking at. If you're looking at something, uh, you want high resolution imaging and you don't care about the rest of the earth, you only want a little piece of that and low earth orbit that really works great. So, so indeed, um, uh, this is uh, the set of orbits that are so important uh, and we have uh, nations, all nations uh, that are participating in space have some assets almost in each of these orbits, but certainly LEO and sometimes even GEO uh, because they need the communication. Okay, now I want to uh, talk about special locations. Now, what, what do I mean by special locations? Well, when one writes down all these laws, and begins to take a good look at them and, and add Newton's laws into Kepler's laws, all of a sudden some really neat little points come out. And these are called the Lagrange points, okay? So here's the sun, that's at the center, and there's the earth as you, as you see. And these L points that are labeled are called Lagrangian points, okay? L1 is between the sun and the earth. <clears throat> L2 is behind the Earth, okay? L3 is on the other side of the sun, and L4 and L5 uh, form 60 degree angles between uh, the sun and the Earth. Now, each of these locations, if you put a spacecraft in these locations, it will stay there. That's phenomenal when you think about it. It's it's understandable uh, uh, when you look at L4 and L5. Yeah, that's an Earth orbit. Even L3, that's an Earth orbit. Yeah, the Earth's uh, uh, gravitational pull wants to take things in L4 and L5 and pull them inward. Bring, you know, Newton's law says I'm going to take L things at L4 and L5 and drive it into the Earth. Uh, but, but the Sun has enough gravity to keep it in that orbit and therefore it becomes a gravitational null. That's a, sometimes the term we use. And therefore spacecraft can stay exactly at that point. Now, here's the other really exciting things about L1 and L2. Things that are in orbit at L1 go around the sun faster than the earth does. So things, Things inside that uh, between the sun and the earth should have shorter periods. This is one of Kepler's laws. Okay, the period squared uh, equals uh, the um, a period, uh, 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 sorry, the, the distance uh, cubed. And so consequently, that means uh, if you're interior to the earth, you, you should be going around faster. Your year is shorter, okay, as we showed in the diagram. Venus's year is shorter than Earth's. Mercury's year is shorter than the Earth. So what happens at L1? Well, at L1, L1 wants to speed up. It wants to go by the Earth. The sun's gravity is pulling it to do exactly that. The gravity of the Earth, Newton says, is strong enough to pull it back. That, this, this gravitational fight between the sun and the Earth, allowing things in L1 to stay in L1, okay? And the same thing is in L2. L2 is at a location for which things slow down. So the sun is saying, okay, anything in L2, you don't have to move as fast as the earth. The problem is the earth is so close to you, the earth is gonna pull on you and therefore pulls uh, that, uh, that, that spacecraft that sits there uh, to the point where it's a gravitational null, and you can put something there and it will stay there. Let's look at some examples. Now, here's a spacecraft. Uh, this is a, a, a very important spacecraft. It's a making observations uh, at L1. 
and uh, it gets into these uh, elliptical orbits and it keeps getting more and more energy. And as it goes around, it, the, the energy gets greater and greater. Finally, it gets out to L1 as a final burn and then can stay there, okay? And because you don't, you don't want it exactly at L1 because you, you, your radio waves come from the sun, interfere with the radio waves of the spacecraft sending information back to the Earth. You want to actually give it a little ump and keep it in an orbit around L1. You actually can orbit L1, okay? And we use this a lot for many different uh, spacecraft. Those in particular that are looking at the solar wind and other images of the SOHO spacecraft that we talked about last time is sitting at L1, making those spectacular sun measurements. And SOHO is a European Space Agency spacecraft. Well, JWST, we also talked about JWST last time. Here is JWST's orbit. Here's the sun. You can see that in the upper left, then the Earth, and then right in the lower corner on the right is JWST, and it's orbiting L2. And in fact, it took several weeks for it to take this path from the Earth out to L2. This is uh, very far away. It's about four or five times the distance from the moon, uh, from the Earth moon out to L, L, uh, uh, L2 here. In fact, um, Earth's moon is shown uh, in this slide. If you just look at the, uh, uh, the circle that goes around, uh, goes around the Earth, that's actually the moon. Okay, so very special points, Grangian points, allow these things to happen. And, and so now let's end our, our talk by reviewing a little bit what we have found out. Well, uh, Kepler's three laws of motions work for two bodies in space, uh, you know, and, and um, these orbits can be circular, elliptical, parabolic, or hyperbolic, characterized by what we call eccentricity, okay? The circle being one, Sorry, circle being zero, uh, uh, parabolic orbit being one, uh, and anything in between is elliptical, and greater than one is uh, hyperbolic, right? Newton's law of gravity. This is where forces have to be matched. Newton's law of gravity combined with Kepler's laws give us these Lagrangian points, these special type of orbits. And there's three basic orbits uh, around the Earth, that are Leo, Mio, and Geo. Uh, and these have uh, characteristics, whether they're equatorial and moving with the Earth and it's, as it spins or against the Earth or even polar. And then there are special locations, as I mentioned, which are uh, Lagrange points. All right, so here we are with a fabulous spacecraft in orbit. Does uh, anyone, can anyone tell me what that orbit is? It's a brilliant space station. Leo. Inspiration. Yes, it's in Leo. Yes, thank you. And, and, well, of course, the gave it away. But here it is. It's an absolutely spectacular spacecraft. Uh, anyone that wants to come down, and let's talk about this beautiful spacecraft. I want to thank everybody for uh, indeed dropping in and listening to our orbits talk. And I hope uh, you, you learn a little bit about how we use these orbits to make fabulous observations. And this is one of the most spectacular spacecraft uh, we have ever, ever, ever put into low Earth orbit. Thank you very much. And I can take some questions. That may have come up. Jim, so here's a question. Uh, does the required orbit for a spacecraft determine the launch location from the Earth? Yes, it does. Um, uh, and the reason why uh, you uh, blast it off, you get a certain amount of energy, you get in orbit, you have a certain inclination, all right? Uh, you also have, therefore, um, uh, a, an important viewing geometry based on that. You can change your inclination. 
it is the hardest thing to change because it requires so much energy uh, that um, uh, it's, uh, it's done on occasion, but not very often. Therefore, you want to launch, you want to have the right uh, 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 inclination, and you want to get in the right orbit as soon as you possibly can. But also the, the position of the spacecraft depends on the mission. If my mission yeah. requires Earth observation, goes to LEO. Communications goes to GEO. It turns out there are some spacecraft that are observing the Earth, and they are even in L1. Uh, we, oh, have called, yeah, we have a spacecraft called Discover. It's in L1, and it is observing the Earth. Whole, whole beauty of the Earth. Uh, like every 30 minutes, you get a beautiful picture of the Earth, uh, and those are those are uh, taken and uh, and indeed put on the web. What's the type of Earth observation? What's the type of Earth observation that this spacecraft is doing? It's looking at the entire lit globe all at once. So you see the weather at every latitude. Uh, you weather. see the northern the weather in the northern hemisphere. You see the weather in the southern hemisphere, and of course, um, as the Earth spins. You get all kinds of variations. Um, you know, um, uh, what's called the Coriolis force moves winds mm -hmm. off the equator and spins around uh, going uh, towards the North Pole. Uh, they also spin off the equator and go to the South Pole. Uh, and so those are very different wind patterns. Here's the cupola right here. This is where the astronauts will, will look out and look down and see, uh, see the Earth from the from uh, 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 the space station, this beautiful, beautiful uh, blue planet we have, not there, here, here it is, right here. Come over here, Noah. There it is, right there. That's it, that's it, that's it. And then yeah. we, the position here is, it was designed to be able to see the arm. But here's the Canadian arm above us and that moves mm -hmm. on a track yeah. and then that places things such that then uh, you can look out this window and move uh, move the arm to get things in place. Okay, any other questions? No, I think we're all done. Cool. All right, well, thanks very much. I, I certainly enjoyed it. And um, uh, we're going to have another you, lecture. This is gonna be uh, a fabulous lecture by uh, Jim Adams, I will I will be in the back in the metaverse to introduce him. He is a, a, a spectacular engineer, been involved in more than two dozen missions, and uh, he's going to help us understand what does it take to actually make observations from a spacecraft. How do you have to do it? What are the systems necessary for it to operate in space? So thank you very much. We move layers in silence. Leave it all behind it. Let infusions are failing. That it's it. This place we move with silence. Technology we fly. And now we travel so far away. Fly, fly, fly. We fly through the sky. No frontiers can open our minds. No, we're not so far from the train. Energy brings us light. Running at the midnight, a white light, a super light. Oh, oh, until the twilight, the bright skies, a super light. Oh, oh, run up to the moon. We will go beyond the reason tonight. We're going, 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 going,